Hi everybody and welcome uh, to the uh, final part of this webinar series where we focus, have been focusing on injury mitigation utilizing EMG sensors. This is part four of a four part series. The last one is going to be focusing on how to utilize EMG sensors in the rehabilitation stage on injury prevention. But first before we get started I'd like to try to thank Strive Technology for hosting this uh, series. My name is Marco Nunez. I'm a performance athletic trainer. I've spent a majority of my career, a little bit over 21, 22 years, working in the professional setting. Most recently, I was a head athletic performance for the Los Angeles Lakers of the NBA. If you have any questions regarding EMG, you're welcome to DM me on my Instagram at MarcoANunez17 or reach out to Strive Technology directly. So before we officially get started, I just want to kind of review some of the objectives that we're going to be focusing on in this final part of the series. Uh, first of all, we're just going to kind of re quickly review what is surface EMG. We're going to talk about some of the benefits of EMG and some of the categories of EMG sensors, the purpose of utilizing EMGs. We're going to discuss a little bit of some of the, the previous limitations before how the EMG um, technology has, has evolved and how specifically Strive Tech has been able to evolve that technology and be able to take it a step further. Then we're going to obviously focus in the usage and rehabilitation as a feedback technology. We're going to go over some research studies and then finally go over some case studies involving EMG sensors. So first we're going to kind of just define or review what surface electromyography or EMG is and it's oftentimes identified as a technique for detecting and recording the electrical activity of the muscles using surface electrodes. So this is oftentimes done in the clinic where the electrodes are placed on the surface of the skin and we're, we're basically detecting or looking for muscle activity or muscular output, so to speak. The EMG signal is used in mostly biomechanics, mainly as an indicator of the initiation of the muscle activation. Basically, we want to identify when the muscle is being activated, how long it's being activated, um, and if it's even activated at all. It's also utilized as an indicator of the force that's being produced by a contracting muscle. We want to see how much muscular output is being produced by a specific muscle or specific muscles, if that is the case. But oftentimes, it's just looking at one specific area, one specific muscle. And it's also utilized as an index of fatigue occurring within a muscle. So in other words, we want to see how much muscular output is being produced. And at one point, at what point is that muscle no longer producing that similar that same amount of muscular output where it starts decreasing, which then is being identified as a fatigue stage or, or has hit the fatigue stage. Um, and oftentimes, as we know as, as healthcare providers or practitioners, majority of injuries to any uh, body part, joint, or muscles, or ligaments oftentimes occur when the athlete has reached that fatigue stage. So that's why statistically, especially in football, um, a lot of the injuries that have been shown have been identified where, when their soft, soft tissue injuries have been identified um, occurring most likely in the third quarter, the fourth quarter, once some, the athletes reach some kind of fatigue stage. But if, having said that, we're going to be also looking at utilizing it as a rehabilitation tool as to identify when that muscle starts fatiguing as we're rehabbing an athlete, when they, in other words, when they start reaching a compensatory stage or a compensation stage where we don't want because we're trying to focus on that specific muscle they're rehabbing or specific muscles to try to strengthen a specific joint or create an, an increased instability in a specific joint. Now, one of the greatest benefits of utilizing EMG sensors is that it visually displays the magnitude of the effort of target muscles contraction to patients and clinicians in real time. We're able to see when a muscle contracts, how it contracts, how much it contracts, how long it, that muscular output is being sustained. Often we can use this with a video overlay or slow motion replay to further pinpoint the biomechanics associated with that specific muscle activation. So we're able to see when the muscle activates, how often it act activates, how it correlates, how it operates, or how it, it, it relates to other muscles within that specific area.
Now here we see an image of a traditional EMG sensors that is being applied to specific muscle. Um, as you can see, there's the ultrasound probe, there's the, the EMG electrodes that are being applied to, to the specific muscle. The athlete or the individual here is applying some kind of force to the force plate that, and then the clinician is able to identify. But at the same time, if you, as you can see the graphs up top, the, in this case, the individual is performing an isometric contractions. The electrodes then record the ultrasound, which shows into a video. The process is ultrasound data into qualitative feedback in real time so that both the uh, patient or the athlete is able to see the muscular output that's being produced during that contraction, whether it's isometric or isokinetic, and more importantly, the clinician that's um, rehabbing or working with the athlete or the patient is able to see what is going on as far as the muscular output while the, that individual is producing that contraction. So one of the biggest um, benefits of um, EMG sensors is that huge component of feedback that you're able to objectively see what is happening within that muscular output as the athlete or as in the individual or the, as in the patient in this case is producing that force and we can see if if we're if we're creating what we want to create. Now, as we saw in the in the image right before the slide, we were able to see the individual con create the contraction or the isometric contraction, and then we were able to see the um, the feedback or the images or the data that was being produced. Now, utilizing EMG sensors, there's usually five major categories that are being applied, or we can identify, or or we can utilize for EMG sensors. Um, first one is that it often answers the mus if, whether the muscle is active or not. So basically when the, the individual contracts the muscle, um, we're able to see whether the muscle is being activated or not, or more importantly, if that specific muscle that we're trying to rehab or, or this, whether that specific muscle that we want the individual or the patient to contract, whether it's being active or not. Second, which muscle is more or less active than the one compared with? Oftentimes we're either doing a comparison um, between a antagonist and agonist muscle or within that same group of muscles which muscle is being produced more for example if we're looking at the hamstring muscles we know that the hamstring muscles themselves are there are three key muscles there and whether the, the muscle that we're looking for the individual to be able to contract um, is being contracted because that's the one we're kind of rehabbing or we're just looking at a comparison between the hamstring and the quad ratio Set, uh, third we're also looking for the muscle timing when is it on? When is it off? How long is it on? How long? At what point is it fatigue? At what point does it shut off? So EMG sensors allows us to be able to identify the muscle timing. Um, the fourth one, like I mentioned, amount of muscle activity. How long is the muscle being activated and how long the muscle is being contracted on that part? And basically, in other words, at what point does the athlete uh, or the specific muscle reaches a fatigue stage that the muscle is no longer being activated? And like I mentioned, trying to get ahead of myself here as far as the, the final the fifth one is to identify muscle fatigue. When the muscle is no longer being contracted, at what point is the muscle pretty much shutting down because it's been pushed to its limit and it has basically reached the fatigue stage. Now we're going to look at the purpose of an EMG in rehabilitation stage. So the first one is basically the role of being able to evaluate the neuromuscular activation within any type of physical activity. Um, this is where we can identify what are the muscles being produced, what is the neuromuscular activity during any specific activity, whether we're having an individual do a squat, a lunge, a bridge, sprinting, jogging, running. Um, oftentimes, most of these activities are done in the clinical setting because traditionally, the old or the traditional EMG sensors that we've been utilized have wires and either attach to a computer, just like we saw the image of the individual uh, prior to this that he or she was pretty much sitting on a station on a, on, a, on a chair and was producing an isometric contraction but that's still the physical activity that we're asking the individual to do to create a isometric contraction with its legs while they were applying um, uh, output into that force plate. Second, EMG is recognized as an objective measurement method. That's the one thing that we do here as, as, as clinicians that we want to look as, as much as to objective measurements. Um, traditionally, we've always used subjective measurements as far as asking the individual, how much are you pushing? Do you feel you're, put, you're putting all your force in it? Do you feel like you're pushing at 100%? Um, how are you feeling? And oftentimes, we use that feedback, uh, what the athlete or the individual is providing for us to be able to determine what exercise or where, how we proceed with the rehab or how we proceed with the activity. But in this case, 
um, we can see the measurement as an objective measurement. Now, that's one of my favorite things with the Strive technology here. Answers is that the athlete can no longer cheat. And by being able to identify and getting that, the feedback, we can see the muscle being must, uh, uh, contracted or there's activity. So either one, there is activity or there is no activity. Whether the, uh, the individual or the athlete tries to produce activity, whether he or she can or cannot, we are able to objectively be able to identify that area. Um, and that's one of my favorite things to be able to do whenever we're doing a, a squat, a lunge, our DL, our bridge, you name it. You can see whether the muscle is being objectively or being um, contracted and for how long uh, from an objective measurement. Finally, the third one is being analyzed the function and the coordination of muscles during any kind of physical performance in both healthy and disabled um, subjects. So this is one of the examples as far as being able to see what is the, the functionality and the coordination between the muscles. One of the biggest components here is being identified between the quad and the hamstring ratio. That's one of the biggest indicators for injuries pertaining to ACL or anything in the knee joint when there is a huge amount of um, discrepancy between the quad and the hamstring. There's been plenty of research studies out there performed that you want to keep that ratio above 0.8. Anything above that is considered a very low risk. Usually 0.6 is a minimum that you want to sustain. Anything below that, the athlete is considered at a high risk of injury um, to the knee and, and most likely to the ACL. Now, this is one of the uh, important issues or statements pertaining that helps as far as clinicians, the role of EMG for planning treatments and assessing their effectiveness. In other words, utilizing uh, sensors during your rehabilitation stage allows you to be able to determine objectively, again, we go to the objection, objective um, word, as far as uh, be able to plan your treatment and be able to determine whether your treatment is being eff effective with what you're doing. So the information on muscle activation during a movement or effort adds to the clinical evaluation and provides a picture of both impairment and functional alteration. So in other words, the EMG sensors will allow you to, to give you feedback as a clinician to determine whether the exercise that you've implemented or the, uh, as, as part of a treatment is being effective. Is, the, is that muscle being activated? Is that muscle being um, contracted? Is the athlete being productive with that, that specific exercise? If not, then it allows you to change or modify your exercise, whether just modify the exercise itself or completely eliminate it and find a different exercise that can cr create that, pr that muscular output or production that you're looking for um, during your rehab stage. Now, in the previous slide, we talked about functional and impairments. Now, here's an example of how Strive technology was being able to utilize to identify some muscular impairments within a specific um, athlete. Now, obviously, the name of the athlete, that's not the, the name of the athlete, which is holding as far as anonymous athlete or confidential. But here's some of the data that was being produced, and this is actual data from a specific athlete. So if we look at the graphs on the left-hand side, we'll look at the 16%, the 35%, and the 99%. These are the numbers as far as the symmetry between the left and right leg uh, muscular output. So we're comparing how much muscular output is coming from the specific muscle between the right and left leg. And here between the hamstring, the quads, um, and I believe the top one or the bottom one should be the, uh, the, the glute ratio there. So either way, we're looking at that there's a 16%, so they're in the yellow zone, so they're somewhat at a moderate risk. But as far as the middle one, when it comes to the the hamstring one, we're looking at a huge discrepancy between the left and the right leg hamstring muscles. In other words, the athlete is producing a lot more force from the right hamstring compared to the left hamstring. So this data was being able to utilize by the athletic training staff, the sports medicine staff, to create a specific program to try to create or decrease the impairments and create a balance or symmetrical balance between the left leg and the right leg. Obviously, as we understand as far as clinician, when there is an impairment or there's a huge discrepancy between one leg and the other leg, there is a higher risk of injury because the athlete is going to start compensating or utilizing more force from the other one. Now, after some period of time of being able to create a program for this individual, the data on the right-hand side shows some of the uh, results of the programs that the sports medicine staff and the strength and conditioning staff was able to create and implement with the athlete and then now they were able to get the athlete into some symmetry in all different areas. The top one 
where he was at 60%. Now he was able to identify that 70%, so he was within a green area, within a safe area. The hamstrings, which were the the, 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 the biggest discrepancy area as far as the impairments were, originally was at 35%. Now he is at an 8% um, discrepancy, which keeps him within a, a low risk of injury area. And even the quads, where originally they were at 9% and they were still in the green, now he is at a 5%. So the data that the um, sports medicine staff was able to decipher or retrieve from, from utilizing the uh, EMG sensors, it allowed them to create a specific program and also monitor the, the progression of the, the, the exercises and be able to determine whether one, the exercises were effective or two, the exercises were not effective. So they had to kind of modify the exercise and create something new. And the results were the ones on the right hand side where they were able to get the athlete within a safe, a safe zone um, pertaining to the symmetries between the left and the right leg. So now we're gonna talk about utilizing the EMG applications in the orthopedic rehabilitation stage. And one of the biggest things is that the EMG space indices assessing muscle activation, which we've already kind of talked about, the symmetry, which was mentioned in the previous slide, and localized fatigue. That's one of the biggest factors that we want to identify when the athlete reaches a fatigue stage during their rehabilitation stage. Yes, we want to activate the muscle, we want to get that muscle going, but at some point when that muscle reaches a fatigue stage, we all know that fatigue eventually leads to compensation. And at that point, either the athlete is just producing the, the, uh, the activity because they're trying to kind of accomplish it, but are they being very productive? If this can be used to support the selection of the therapeutic exercises and to monitor their effectiveness over time. So in other words, at some point, as we all know, when we're rehabbing an athlete or an individual, if the exercises aren't being productive or ineffective, we can always change those exercises, but oftentimes we use it as a, we, we gather the subjective information from our patient or our, or our athlete and ask them how they're feeling. And based on that information, we can modify the exercise. But now we can utilize some kind of the EMG sensors from Strive or anything like that sort to be able to get objective data and information. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit of fatigue in the next slide. Now, this slide's a little bit interesting, and, I, and I, it's what, probably one of my favorites, and we also went ahead and used this also previously, I believe, in the in the part three as far as performance. Now, this is kind of interesting because this shows a, a how an athlete reaches the fatigue stage. They are able to start compensating, but they are still able to produce or complete the task. So in this part, an athlete was required to do a 400 meters, basically run around uh, the track, um, it, this individual was a, was a runner and they were basically timed um, as far as how quickly they're able to complete the 400 meters. Now, time has been utilized as a deciding factor when an athlete starts reaching a fatigue state. Obviously, if they don't stay within a specific time of uh, running around the track or the 400 meters, then the, the coach naturally begins to assume that they're starting to fatigue. Now, the interesting part about here, if, if we look at the data here, the individual that was doing this, he, uh, they, I believe it was a she, she was able to complete the task within the specific times for the first 10, 11 laps. Now, the interesting part about it is that she was able to continue, um, be able to produce and complete the task within the same, the same specific time, I believe up to like the 14th lap and even possibly the 15th. Around the 17th, 17th or 18th lap, that's when actually she started reducing or her time to complete the task started increasing. So the coach assumed that she had already reached a fatigue stage. But the interesting part about this is that if we look at the data at about the at about lap 11 or, or attempt 11 is when she started producing more force to be able to complete the task. At about lap 13, 14, and 15, you can see there was a huge discrepancy which, with, between all the muscular outputs. So that tells us that at that point around lap 13, 14, the athlete actually began reaching the stage of fatigue, and not only the stage of fatigue, but more importantly, the stage of compensation. So she started compensating within each muscle group in that area to be able to produce a task. Now, one, there's not a huge, there's not necessarily a big problem with that because as we, we had mentioned in part two and part three of this webinar series, series is that our bodies or athletes are, are what we refer to as compensation machines. That's what we do, that's what our body does, is compensates, they find a way to be able to accomplish the task. But the question is, 
at what point does the compensation going to lead to some sort of injury? So this data was able to tell us as far as when the athlete was able to reach the fatigue stage way before she started increasing her time while doing the laps. Now, these are some of the uh, touch about some of the previous limitations. So for years, owning an EMG system was impractical for many clin clinics or clinics just because of the numerous wires, long setup time, complex software required to do this. Here's an example of a traditional EMG sensors. Um, as you can see, uh, I know there's a little wiring there and then the little microchips and all that's cut out, but that's kind of somewhat what it appeared to look like. You had the wires, you were kind of stationary, just like we saw the image previously with the individual that was sitting down. They had to be stationary. They were able to kind of produce the output. And traditionally, most of the EMG sensors that were kind of utilized for feedback were kind of pretty much um, had to be at a specific area um, you were able maybe perhaps do some squats and lunges, but you were kind of confined to a specific area you weren't able to move. But technology has been maturing rapidly, and there has been an emergence of wireless sensors that allow free movement and streamlined software for easy and setup and interpretation. Now, here is where Strive um, technology kind of comes to play. They had the opportunity, they've been able to take those same, same EMG sensors be able to apply it to the shorts where the athlete is able to wear the shorts and be able to complete or, or be able to um, move and function in any manner and be able to participate in the sports while you're tracking their movements. In other words, you can do rehab, um, rehabilitation activities in the weight room, continue in the training room, take them out to the court, to the field, um, and do everything that you need to do to try to kind of get them help them to do a return to play and be able to have them perform specific tasks that you, you need them to do, and more importantly, be able to monitor them as they're going through this task to allow you to be able to continue their rehab stage as far as the return to play. Because as we all know, the return to play does not just fit, is not done and is accomplished in a clinical setting or in, the, in a specific uh, training room. You have to get them out to the field. You have to get them into their environment, whether it is the basketball court, whether it's a tennis court, whether it's a baseball field, whether it's a football field, and get them to do sports-specific training. Um, with Strive Technology, Strive Shorts, you're able to get them out there, you're able to get them move, continue doing those rehab exercises, and more importantly, be able to objectively monitor them as you're progressing them through their milestones as they are returning to play. Now here is just an example of the information that you can gather while you're utilizing shorts, as you can see here is the athlete um, performing just some simple squats. He's out in the field. There are no wires, but you're still able to produce all this information that, uh, as the athlete's producing the, uh, creating this exercise. You can see how much muscular output is coming from the quads, the hamstrings, left and right symmetry, how long the muscular output is lasting, how long is the activity, and if they are reaching a fatigue stage. Now here we're looking at some of the factors that are associated with physiological dysfunction among athletes or individuals. One of them, of course, the first one is the kind of muscle weakness. When there's when there's muscle weakness in a specific area, it creates some kind of dysfunction. Um, prime example, if uh, if we look at the knee, we're looking at instability of the knee. There's plenty of research studies that have identified the majority of the stability that comes from stability that's associated with the knee come from the glute max, glute med. So if we have muscular weakness from the glute max, glute med, most likely there's going to be some dysfunction at the knee. Now, research data also has identified that some that the glute max uh, and glute med also are associated with muscular with dysfunction in the ankle as well. So if you have an athlete that has a history or as we identify chronic ankle stability, odds are that this individual will also have some muscular weakness coming from the glute max, glute med. But be able to identify, would be a great way to identify it with utilizing some kind of sensor technology to be able to objectively identify it and track it. The second one is timing of the muscle activation. So oftentimes when we're looking at landing mechanics when it comes to injury prevention, where again, we want knee stability coming from the glute max, glute med, the hip area, it doesn't necessarily mean that we want the muscle to be able to active for long periods of time, but we do want that muscle to be able to activate at a specific time when they're landing mechanics, when we want that need to be able to stabilize, we want that muscular output coming from that specific muscle 
doesn't have to be a long period of time, but we need it to be able to activate it at a specific time. Again, utilizing some kind of sensor technology, like associated with Strike Tech, it allows you to identify the timing of those muscles being activated while you're rehabbing, while you're doing those, those exercises. So in other words, there's been pl plenty of studies, there's plenty of data, I've seen plenty of videos both on YouTube, Instagram, that I see physical therapists utilizing the landing mechanics where you see an individual kind of jump, land, and then you kind of give them a little push or a little nudge while they're in the air. And then when they land, the goal is to be able to, for them to stabilize, which is great and they can do that. But the question is, is that is the stabilization coming from that glute max, glute mean, where we want it to come in, or is the athlete just basically compensating and has figured out a way how to be able to control it? Now, in a controlled environment, the athlete may be able to do that. But in an uncontrolled environment, which they pretty much play their games in an uncontrolled environment, either are they able to do that same um, landing mechanics or stabilization utilizing EMG sensors while the athletes practicing while they're playing while they're in a, an uncontrolled environment would be a great way to be able to identify whether the exercises that you were um, working with them in a lab setting or in a control setting are actually transferring over to that uncontrolled setting because if they're not then those exercises that you've done have not have been effective and have not been successful so as a, as a physical therapist or um, at the trainer, we need to identify the, which exercises are going to be the most effective for that individual. Finally, the last one is proprioception. Where there is a lack of proprioception, there's a huge dysfunction, whether it's coming from the knee, coming from the angle. Again, when we're looking at these muscles, we're looking at the muscles and, and making sure that the muscles are being properly contracted to create that proprioception, or is the athlete just creating a compensatory pattern and they've just learned how to kind of create some kind of balance in a controlled setting. And the proprioception, I know uh, we had talked about this in a previous uh, segment, or I, I believe it was part two or part three, where there's a huge study out there that talks about chronic ankle stability and how the fatigue, when an athlete reaches the fatigue stage, there lacks um, stability in the ankle or proprioception in the ankle, whether you've had a history of chronic ankle stability or not. The study, I think from what I recall, took a group of young ladies, um, separated them into athletes that have had chronic ankle stability, and, a, group, and uh, a second group where athletes have not had a history of chronic ankle stability. And what they did, they tested them before, um, originally at, at a rest stage when they were rested, and you know the, the athletes that have not had any chronic ankle stability did well. And what they did is basically they put him through a fatigue stage. Basically, they put him through a program to try to get that glute mass, glute meat as fatigued as possible, and they tested them again. Well, at that point, a good amount of athletes that have had that didn't have ankle uh, chronic instability started showing some lack of dysfunction in that area, for perception. So, being able to identify those specific areas would be great. Objectively, utilizing some kind of sensor system. So now we're going to get into more of the usage as far as uh, biofeedback or EMG sensors in the rehabilitation setting. So clinicians are beginning to identify the best exercise for patients to target these muscles with the assistance of surface electromyography or EMG, which measures the electrical output of the muscles. Like I mentioned before in the slide before this is are the exercises that you are producing or you're working with your athlete or your client in a clinical setting, are they being tr effectively being transferred to the uncontrolled environment or out when they're playing, utilizing some kind of uh, feedback or objective feedback like EMG sensors would allow you to be able to identify, hey, the, whether the exercise that I'm doing with my uh, client is effective, is working, is that muscle being uh, produced or being contracted like I want to be able to do it. A prime example, a couple of years ago, I was rehabbing an athlete from a hamstring injury and I had him utilizing his shorts. The great benefit that I was able to see this is that when I wanted the athlete to contract a specific muscle, whether it was a hamstring or the glute, I was able to identify it and, and give me direct, immediate, that's a, the most important part, immediate feedback as the athlete's producing the exercise. And it was able to tell me whether the athlete was successfully contracting that muscle that I wanted him to contract in order for us to get him to a, a, a specific stage or milestone. And second, the athlete was able to see whether he was contracting that specific muscle that I was asking him to do so, 
or was he just kind of compensating? Now, I, I kind of got ahead of myself right here. The next one down below is a real, real time feedback. I think that's one of the most important things when it comes to um, EMG sensors that it can visually or audibly alert patients when they are properly recruiting their forgotten um, musculature, thus facilitating proprioceptive and neuromuscular re education. So the immediate feedback that you as a clinician is going to receive and also as your as your client or your athlete can be is immeasurable because it allows you to be able to see whether the athlete is doing what they need to do or contract the specific muscle that you want them to contract. Now as we continue as far as the usage and rehabilitation feedback, the visual and the audio biofeedback from EMG units have been shown to be effective augmentation therapies in the treatment of many lower limb dysfunctions. Now we're gonna get into a couple of research studies that have been able to identify this. So the first one we're gonna talk about is uh, the correlation of the relationship between the glute, glute muscle activity and patellofemoral pain syndrome. This is done as far as a systematic interview. So as we all know, patella, um, Femoral pain syndrome is one of the most common presentations to sports uh, medicine practitioners, whether it's in basketball, oftentimes it's identified in athletes where um, a some kind of plyometric exercise, but in general, any type of runner or anything of that sort, so it's not just related to basketball, volleyball, or anything of that sort. There's been plenty of growing evidence to support the association of glute max strength. We talked about this earlier. Deficits in individuals with patellofemoral pain syndrome and the effectiveness of the glute Glute, glute strengthening when treating patellofemoral pain syndrome. So in other words, the relationship between the glute max is highly correlated with it, with athletes experience patellofemoral syndrome. In other words, when they have poor glute max uh, muscles, um, as we've talked about before, that the glute max, glute meat are huge knee stabilizers that start experiencing patellofemoral um, stress syndrome in that area. In addition, an impressive body of work has been evaluated. Glute, glute EMG has recently emerged, further supporting the importance of glute muscle function in patellofemoral pain syndrome. So, in this systematic review, Bard and all, they performed a systematic review on EMG findings in order to better understand the role of glute max activity in the management of patellofemoral stress syndrome. Now, during this systematic review, they discovered four studies that evaluate the duration of muscle activity for the glute meat during functional tests. So what they were able to kind of correlate, or actually, I'm sorry, uh, conclude was that there was strong evidence that indicated in individuals with patellofemoral pain syndrome demonstrated a shorter duration of the glute meat activity during star, um, stair uh, ascent. So in other words, just like I mentioned before, we talked about uh, the muscular uh, activity, it doesn't necessarily always mean that we want the muscle to be activated throughout the whole entire time, but more importantly, we want the muscle being activated at the specific time that we required. In this case, what they identified is that the glute meat wasn't um, activated during a specific start ascent as it was supposed to do it, or there was just short periods of duration. So in other words, the muscle would fire, would fatigue, and then would be done. Modern evidence indicates individuals with patellofemoral pain syndrome exhibit a shorter duration of glute meat activity during stair descent. So in other words, kind of goes back again with the duration of the muscle and the activity when you want it to activate it and how long you want it activated. In this case, some of the studies that they identified is that individuals that experience patellofemoral pain syndrome, there was very short duration of the glute meat, meat being activated. So as a healthcare professional, um, or, or clinician, our goal is try to create the, the glute meat stamina or endurance to be able to last, try to help reduce the athletes that are experiencing patellofemoral pain syndrome. Now, in this other study here, they looked at the efficacy of EMG feedback and electrical stimulation following an arthroscopic partial mastectomy. Um, so here they basically took and wanted to identify whether individuals that went through a rehab protocol of 
utilizing by feedback as their method of rehabilitation or electrical stimulation. Now, electrical stimulation has been widely used and is commonly used and it will continue being utilized as a form of rehab too. Oftentimes when we're re-educating the muscle, when an athlete's coming back from any type of knee surgery, in this case it was a uh, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, the stimulation that's often kind of utilized is uh, Russian stim, where we've taught the athletes or we educate the athletes that when the um, stimulation is being activated, you want to contract it with the muscle, and that's a, a tool that we're trying to that we utilize to re-educate the muscle and increase the muscular output, so to speak, or kind of make it stronger. So, a uh, et al. research and compared the effectiveness of electromyography by feedback training and electrical stimulation therapy for rehabilitation following arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. So in order to, for them to perform their, uh, their study or their trial, they basically had 45 patients who had recently undergone uh, surgery for arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, were, and each of them, or all, or all 45 were separated in, into three groups, 50 patients in each group. The control group, one had basically just home exercises. That's all they had to do, just specific exercises, go home, do uh, education, education, home exercises, and that's it. The second group and third groups were received either EMG feedback, training, or electrical stimulation therapy for the quadriceps muscles in addition, in addition to the home exercises. So you had a group that did the home ex you had all three groups do home exercises. One just had home exercises. The other two had either both both had home exercises, but one of them either had just utilizing EMG sensors as far as biofeedback, and the other one used the electrical stim in combination with the home exercises. Now here are some of the results that they were able to identify within the group. So the timing using a walking aid was 8.3. Um, 1.5 and 4.5 days for the home exercise, the EMG feedback, and the electric stimulation group. So the individuals that utilize home exercise, they utilize it, use the walking aid for it took them to, to get rid of the walking aid or no longer utilize the walking aid, it took them about 8.3 days. The group that used the feedback, the biofeedback or the EMG along with the home exercises, it took them one and a half days on the average. And the group that utilized the electrical simulation and the home exercises, it took them five, uh, an average of 4.5 days to get rid of the walking aid. So in other words, there was significant shorter in the EMG biofeedback training than in the home exercise group. So between the group that just did the home exercises and the first group that the, did the uh, EMG bar feedback and the home exercises, there was a significant between 8.3 and 1.5. Even then, there was still some a good amount of difference between the group that did the bar feedback versus the group that did the electrical simulation because it was 1.5 days to 4.5. There were also significant differences in the vastus medialis oblique muscles the average and the vast lateral, uh, lateralis maximum and the average contraction in favor of the EMG bar feedback compared to the home exercise and electric stimulation in the second uh, post-operative week. So the athletes or the individuals that utilize the combination of the home exercise and the bar feedback saw better results in the muscular output or production uh, uh, between the, the vast medialis obliques and the vast lateralis maximum compared to the individuals that did both the home exercise and just the and the electrical stimulation. So bottom line, at the end of the day, what they conclude is that the addition of the EMG by feedback training to a conventional exercise program following arthroscopic partial meniscectomy helps to speed up the rehabilitation of the process. So in this research study, the addition of utilizing EMG sensors as part of the biofeedback was able to identify that the athletes or the individuals were able to speed up the rehabilitation process compared to just using home exercises and something simple as electrical stim. Most likely it was probably rush stim or anything of that sort. Now here is a specific case study that I was working on uh, with an individual with an athlete. Now before I hit the play button, I'm just gonna give you a quick background on the, on the athlete. 
Um, the athlete is a, I believe was a 23 year old or is a 23 year old basketball player currently at a college trying to seek a NBA career. He had recently had surgery in the lower extremity and also upper extremity. The interesting part about this is when I um, started working with the athlete, the athlete already right away told me, hey, every time I squat, every time I use, um, for some reason, I'm um, being right quad or I'm sorry, right glute dominant. He had trouble activating his left glute. Now, he wasn't 100% sure because he never had any objective testing or assessment done on it. He just kind of felt that he just did that. So when I did my subjective uh, assessment, kind of your basic FMS, um, had him do a basic screening, squatting, uh, single leg squatting, double leg squatting, just as far as uh, eyeballing, you can right away see that there was a weight shift to the right side where he was basically compensating. He was more right glute dominant. He knew that. And it was just interesting that the injury that he sustained was on the left side, most likely because it was compensating or there was kind of some form of muscular weakness. So I utilized these EMGs, uh, the Stripe Tech EMG shorts to be able to identify and more importantly, objectively identify as far as a rehab tool and make sure that the, that the exercises that I was implementing were effective um, and then be able to produce the muscles. So I'm gonna play the video here. Now in this area, when I had him squat, uh, was able to identify with the with the stripe shorts that yes in fact he was right glute dominant every time he did a double leg squat he produced more force from the right glute to be able to kind of contract so my goal was try to get him to be able to utilize the left glute more often than just the right or at least create some symmetry between the the left and the right so the one of the exercise I did which traditionally has been done is put a theraband around their ankle have them do a squat, but what I introduced is I introduced use also a band around their waist where I was kind of pu pulling him towards the left, forcing that left glute to kind of activate. So take a look at the data here. So as you can see, the data on the right hand side, there's the green and the and the uh, the purple. The green shows identifies the the right glute. I'm going to play it again, or the right leg. The purple identifies the left leg. The top graph identifies the quad. The middle graph identifies the hamstring, and the bottom graph identifies the the glute muscles. Now, granted, there's a lot more green than red. I mean, than, than purple, which is fine. But when I did the initial assessment. There was hardly any purple being identified or being able to show. So as I'm doing the exercises, you can see on the, left, on the top left hand side, he's doing some uh, kind of movement jumps with the TheraBand every time he lands. I would be on his left side and I would pull him a little bit to the left side, forcing that right glute to be able to activate as we were going along. And we were able to produce some contraction from the left glute, meaning the left glute was starting to wake up and be able to be present. So now in this next video, once we, I was done um, doing the rehab exercise, I had the athlete do the exact move, exact same movement, the kind of movement jumps with the squats. But in this case, I was not using the red bench to kind of shift them or pull them or force them to the left where it would actually force them to do activate the left glute. I wanted to see whether the left glute muscle was able to be activated and was able to be educated. So when he did do the, the simple um, jump squats, whether the left glute actually started being an active participant. And here's the uh, the data. So here you see him on the left hand side jumping. You see the data on the right hand side. Again, there's still some right uh, glute domi domination here, which is fine, but you can still, now you can see some purple where previously we, when we did the assessment, there was very little purple um, lines coming, of it, coming out of it, meaning there was very little left glute activation. Now there's still some glute, left glute activation here, which is fine. All this pretty much tells me is that the exercise that I was, the rehab exercise that I was doing with him is, is basically validating that it was effective and we were staying and, and, and it was kind of working and, and, and producing that left glute activation. Now this was just some data that was being produced within just a few minutes. We did the exercise a couple of times. We did three sets, about a 10, 12 jumps, but within those exercises, we were able to be able to produce this. So as a clinician, utilizing the Stripe technology, it allowed me to be able to validate that the rehab exercise that I was using is effective and we should stay the course. Now, on the other hand, if I would have done the exercise 
and I did not see that muscular output increase from the left glute, what then that tells me is either one, the athlete was still compensating while we're doing the rehab exercise, or two, the rehab exercise that I selected was not efficient or effective in this case. So in other words, I need to find different exercise to be able to get the left glute um, being activated. And as we know as clinicians, not all individuals are created equal. Everybody's gonna respond differently to whether any type of treatments of the simple ice or specific exercises. So it allows me to either decide, hey, do I wanna stay the course or do I wanna find different exercise? Thank you everybody for attending. We're going to take any questions if you have any at this moment. Uh, let me look at the chat. Um, I think Kate went on there or uh, someone put it on there. I just want to apologize. If you do have any questions regarding Strive technology, make sure you email uh, sports at Strive Tech. They can get you more information regarding the, the Strive technology. If you want to try it out, if you want to look at some of the research data. Um, or maybe perhaps get, get a sample of it. Um, you're welcome to reach me if you have any further questions regarding strike technology, how you can implement it to rehab, how you can implement it or utilize it in your return to play, not only in the clinical setting or in the athletic training room setting, but more importantly on the on the field return to play setting. I think this is one of the greatest benefits of Strive that you're able to take this technology out to the field, out to that environment, out to that, what we refer to as an uncontrolled environment where the athlete is playing, um, where they kind of pretty much live and more, and where they're gonna, where the injuries or the issues are gonna be um, one either created um, or can be more identified versus in a, in a controlled environment. Controlled environment is great to do the rehab and be able to kind of get them through that stage, but the uncontrolled environment is where the injuries occur. That is where you'll see the, the majority of the compensatory patterns, and that's where you want to be able to have objective data, such as uh, using technology such as Strive, to be able to kind of identify this and be able to be able to see it. Okay. Other than that. Um, Feel free to unmute yourself or add any questions on the chat at this moment. We'll give it a few minutes. So somebody there uh, had mentioned, I apologize if I missed it. Oops, sorry for that. Um, but are we seeing raw EMG signals or filtered in real time? No, it is uh, EMG signals in real time. That is the images that I was able to see. If you saw uh, the last two slides when I was working with the athlete, I had the, that was an image that I actually had holding on my phone. I had it in a tripod while I was doing the uh, the, uh, the exercise with the athlete, so I can visually see as the athlete was going ahead and performing that squat, and what, uh, as he was landing, I can see the muscular output coming from the left glute, or whether it was or it wasn't. So it was real time data. You can see it at the moment as they're running, as they're progressing, and that's one of the beauty things about Stripe is that it's real time data that's coming on, on there while you're actually performing the rehab. So if you are having them do a squat, you can see the actual muscular output coming from the right, the left leg, the right glute, the left glute, hamstring, uh, maybe having them do an RDL or anything of that sort. So it's real life, real time data. Thank you, Shane, for the question. Um, I appreciate everybody coming in. If you guys do have any further questions regarding this, you're welcome to either contact me through my Instagram at MarcoAnion17 or contact Strive uh, Tech directly or even Kate Okioma, our, our marketing director. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to go see the previous uh, webinars also, we have the part one, two, three, and four. Feel free to reach out to Strive Tech and we can happy to send you all four of them at one time. Thank you.